Okay, today we'll, 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 uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk, we'll begin our, our talk uh, with uh, Serbian monuments, uh, a phenomenon in the field of architecture, art, uh, environmental art, uh, sculpture, plastic art in general. <clears throat> uh, it's called, this phenomenon is called spom spomenics, spomenics from Yugoslavia. And indeed, they, they erected unbelievable monuments uh, uh, in many places, uh, and uh, they astonish us as they probably were astonishing at the time when they were built. Uh, probably they started to build them around 1960s or so, maybe even 1950s, I don't know exactly. And they, they were built uh, for about 20 years. Uh, I just show one or a few images about each one of them. This is a uh, monumental sculpture but uh, in some places i even call i, I even saw it being um, described as uh, as architecture but it is a sculptural uh, work of uh, monumental proportions and i think it's very very dramatic with these monuments the serbians the serbs they um, they try to pay homage to those who died in the second world war I mean, this is at the scale of a, of, a, of a small building, concrete, but it's, it's dramatic, it's Zarathustrian, it's Nietzschean, it's, it's, it's very emphatic in its desire to, to, to conquer death in a way, to transgress death. This is a building, a building done at that time in communism under Tito's uh, rule, uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, uh, did incredible things in the field of uh, architecture, in the field of um, art, in the field of uh, sculpture. The reason I chose to talk about this today is because um, I, I, I mainly I wanted to address the, the, the first year students who have, uh, you know, who study uh, you know, materials, constructive materials, and, and these are buildings and sculptures done in concrete, like this one. And, you know, in a strange way, and some kind of a strange coincidence or synchronicity, after this, I will talk about Rudolf Steiner. This building has something of, although it's, it's much more contemporary in terms of aesthetics, but it, 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 it stimulates the mind uh, and the eye, I think, somehow uh, in a similar way with, um, with uh, Goetheanu, the building that um, Rudolf Steiner built. So to me, it is amazing that, uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, maybe even 70 years ago almost, uh, the Serbs build such things which are abstract, which are modern, which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated in terms of artistic expression. And uh, in my opinion, they are timeless. They were built then, but they are as relevant now than, uh, than then. In fact, uh, I can give examples of uh, uh, two observatories built in Japan by, um, you know, an important Japanese architect. And, and it, it, parts of the, those observatories are similar to what we look at here. Again, you know, they, they are not all buildings. Some of them are, some are just uh, large uh, sculptural works. Serbia, you can uh, visit them. You could even go by train there or by car. I find them very moving and, 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 and courageous and, and heroic. And I admire the fact that they paid homage to those who died tragically in the Second World War uh, and, uh, and, and they didn't do it, you know, showing uh, soldiers with rifles in their hands, but in an abstract way and in an ex expressive way. This is almost like a metaphor of, the, of, of art conquering death, transgressing death. I find them very moving and visionary. Uh, we already saw a picture of this.
Uh, this is a building. I hope I have other pictures with it because I, I like it. But you see, it's a very heroic, uh, vital, vitalist architecture that they built, as I said, 50, 60 years ago, if not 70. And many. I truly find all this uh, collective work as, as, a, as, a, as a beautiful uh, uh, transgression of death, as a beautiful homage to those who died. Of course, they used a lot of concrete, and that was the reason I chose to talk about this now. But I will see a lot of concrete also in the work of uh, Rudolf Steiner and uh, Livio Vacchini. This uh, sculpture was uh, well known in, in, in Yugoslavia, uh, and um, he did, uh, I think, uh, very moving works, as you can see here. Bravo to them. Because I, I, I think significant artworks are a victory for everybody. Of course, they were done by certain individuals, but somehow it is a collective victory. You know, they, 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 they uh, uh, through their individual work, they transgress their own individuality. So it becomes kind of a, like, a, uh, you know, a, a, collective, a collective achievement. You can see the scale is uh, quite large, almost gigantic. I truly find them very, very moving. It's not just a play with forms. Here is a struggle. It, it is the expressions of an existential and artistic struggle. I also like this picture because, you know, it shows the um, you know, the, the dialectics between the old church and the new sculpture. And, you know, the new and the old can coexist and uh, should coexist. These are unique in the whole world. There is no other country that built at such an extent, you know, innovative, forward-looking artworks at, at this scale. They are unique. Concrete. Much can be done with concrete, too bad it pollutes. But it's a, it's a material that allows for many forms, many shapes. These are our neighbors, no? Next door, so to speak. Former Yugoslavia, bravo to them again. So in communism, 50, 60 years ago, they built such things. No other country in the world did this. You can see they are huge. You see the human silhouette there.
But what do we see here? We see clearly sculpture, but we also see the meeting between sculpture and architecture. And I think a sculptural architectural work is usually better than an architectural work, which is not sculptural. Sculpture adds something to architecture and to an extent perhaps only to an extent, Brunkush was right. Architecture is an inhabitable or inhabited sculpture. I think architecture is more than that, is a little bit different, but to an extent, Brunkush was right. If you have a sculptural quality in your um, architecture, the chance is, is that your architecture deserves its name more than if it was not. Uh, sculptural. Uh, many of these uh, works actually depict struggle, conflict, but also I think they, they depict, you know, uh, the possible redemption through art. And the conquering death, to put it bluntly. I mean, you look, you see the little houses around it, you, I mean, the background, but still, you know, such, uh, you know, almost violently modern monumental structures probably astonished the, you know, the so-called common people. I mean, you know, we can build anything these days, but even today, such a building would look uh, so-called uh, futuristic. In my opinion, and it's not only my opinion, great architecture inspires. You can only imagine these children, you know, you know, exploring the building, moving towards it. Something remains within them, you know, the, the power of, of, of artistic emotion. In its essence, art is a triumph of spirit, of human spirit and human work and human inspiration. Really, these look uh, very forward looking uh, today as well, very much so. I mean, look at this building. Yes, it is abandoned. Yes, it is vandalized but it still has vigor, it still has vitality. The home of the revolution in Montenegro, look at this building. It's a fortress, it's a bulwark of resistance. It has force. I mean, it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter. It is abandoned and vandalized. It still has power. Uh, another we already saw a picture of this. I'm glad I have others here. I don't know what its function is. It's something, yeah, the municipal assembly. Can you imagine this was a political building, a governmental building? These people were really visionaries. Well, I, I'm tempted to think that 200 years from now, 
you know, if there will still be humanity on this earth, if they come across, you know, uh, these works, they would be as astonished as I was when I first saw them. Uh, you see the building here on the left, and you see this building, and they have nothing in common. The, this building didn't try to mimic this house. It's, it's a world in itself. A municipal building. Very powerful. This is almost a fragment of a building by uh, the one we are going to uh, talk about tomorrow on his birthday, on his 94th birthday, that is Frank Gehry. Uh, this was built 56 years ago in former Yugoslavia. Brutalism is also quite um, accomplished in, uh, in Belgrade and in other places, I imagine, in former uh, Yugoslavia. As you can see, they mastered concrete, raw concrete. Great art transforms. This is my belief. Great art could change one's life. It's very possible that that human silhouette, that person there, leaves the sight with something perhaps changed within him. This I could have shown yesterday at the um, Diagonal Festival. Homage to Claude Parent. And the dancer there. I remember what Nietzsche said, I would only believe in a dancing God. And yes, dance is, um, is a primordial art form and uh, we should all dance. I, I, I kept saying this and I will continue to say it. Every single atelier um, session at Minku at the University of Architecture and Urban Planning or Urbanist could start hopefully with 10 minutes of dance. Every, every atelier, every studio, I think it would be great. 10 minutes of dance would change the spirit of everybody. 
If the soldiers in Ukraine, both America, both uh, Russians and uh, Ukrainians, would dance 10 minutes a day, there would be no war. It would be very simple. 10 minutes a day, the same 10 minutes, both armies to dance. There would be no war, meaning there would be no death. It's very sad that we prefer instead to kill instead of dancing. Former Yugoslavia, a lesson in a collective effort of uh, quite uh, un unprecedented, unprecedented dimensions scattered all over the land. And there are others besides these that I show. It was a phenomenon. sponsored by the state of course such an effort uh, needed uh, financial support at the highest level but this is amazing that the political organisms or institutions of former yugoslavia paid for this bravo to them the monument de la discord the monuments of discord I mean, look at this pavilion. I don't know how to call it. I mean, if this if this building was built today in Japan or I don't know where, we would say, wow, it was built in former Yugoslavia 60 years ago. It's it's almost like an unidentified flying object done in concrete. What an outburst of creativity. I'm not a great fan of those uh, figurative, uh, you know, uh, statues, but the building in its ab abstract uh, abs abstraction is, is uh, I would say, um, very moving. Okay, and now we go to the second presentation that is uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner. A uh, very important uh, presence, not just in philosophy, but also in uh, in um, uh, in architecture as well, and not only architecture. Quite a remarkable um, uh, man, Rudolf Steiner. So Rudolf Steiner, 1861, 1925. Uh, so he died at um, 64. Rudolf Joseph Lawrence Steiner, born on the 27th or 25th of February uh, and died in March 1925, was an Austrian philosopher, social reformer, architect, esotericist, and claimed clairvoyant. <laughs> well, I wish more architects would be also at least part of what of the many functions he, um, he addressed. Steiner gained in initial recognition at the end of the 19th century as a literary critic and published philosophical works, including the philosophy of freedom. At the beginning of the 20th century, he founded an esoteric spiritual movement, anthroposophy, with roots in German idealist philosophy and theosophy. Other influences include Goethe and science and Rosicrucianism. So again, he was born in 1861. So he was 16, 16 years older than Le Corbusier, who was born in 1887. Rudolf Steiner. Uh, so, you know, we are dealing here with an exceptional man who attempted, who attempted to find a synthesis between science and spirituality. And by, by the way of science and spirituality, I would like to invite you this year to pay homage to a great scientist and, and spiritual man that is Blaise Pascal. There are 400 years uh, since his, his death or his birth. I forgot. It might be his birth. Sorry. Um, Blaise Pascal. 
either he died 400 years ago or he was born. Sometimes I'm confused. And I guess sometimes I'm confused also in the same way uh, religion is, is confused because uh, they consider sometimes that uh, death is another birth. And maybe it is, maybe Herac Heraclitus was right when he said what we call life is actually death and what we call death is actually life. Who knows? Anyway, we'll, we'll find out about the precise, um, you know, uh, meaning of the, of the 400 celebration of Blaise Pascal. But now we talk about Rudolf Steiner, his philosophical work of these years, which he termed spiritual science, sought to apply the clarity of thinking characteristic of Western philosophy to spiritual questions differentiating this approach from what he considered to be a vaguer approaches to mysticism. In a second phase, beginning around 1907, he began working collaboratively in a variety of artistic media, including drama, the movement arts, developing a new artistic form, eurythmy and architecture, culminating in the building of the Goetheanum, a cultural center to house all the arts. Uh, this is the little house where he was born. Uh, and this is the young uh, Rudolf Steiner, or this was young Rudolf Steiner. Here he is in a, you know, a, a little bit older age. Uh, an intense man, an interesting man. And uh, I, I think he can be and should be uh, an inspiration for us all. He did, never studied architecture, but but he built significantly and not just one building. We are going to see them. Our highest endeavor must be to develop free human beings who are able of themselves to impart purpose and direction to their lives. The need for imagination, a sense of truth and the feeling of responsibility, these three forces are the very nerve of education. Let's read again. The need for imagination, he starts with imagination and Einstein himself stressed that imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is the most important thing. The need for imagination, a sense of truth and the feeling of responsibility. These three forces are the very nerve of education. Rudolf Steiner, if we do not believe within ourselves this deeply rooted feeling that there is something higher than ourselves, we shall never find the truth, the strength to evolve into something higher. Again, if we do not believe within ourselves this deeply rooted feeling that there is something higher than ourselves, then we shall never find the strength to evolve into something higher. Goetheanu. The first one, he built two, but one was um, damaged by fire, and then he built another one. This was the first Goetheanum, and a very uh, particular uh, uh, individual, personal architecture. The first Goetheanum, a timber and concrete structure designed by Rudolf Steiner, was one of 17 buildings Steiner designed between 1908 and 1925. So in 17 years, he built 17 buildings without being an architect. It was intended as a Gesamtkunstwerk, the synthesis of diverse artistic media and sensor, sensory effects infused with spiritual significance. Are we trying to infuse our buildings with spirit, spiritual significance? I doubt it. This is the second one, the second Goetheanum, which still stands. And it is a massive work, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> massive in, uh, in various uh, senses. Das Heitz House, the building that contains the boiler for the hot water, you see a very uh, utilitarian building, but which he elevates at symbolic meanings uh, for the hot water heating system of the first and later second Goetheanums. Of course, the name of the Goetheanum or the Goetheanums comes from Goethe, the great uh, uh, German poet. In his form follows function method of the building. The building is dominated by the smokestack 
while the two qualified towers in the front are reminiscent of boilers. But this is a very simplistic description. This is the this is the building. Did you ever see a boiler room like this? This is a you know a fantastic uh, building that uh, moves beyond uh, an utilitarian uh, the description. After all, you know the building ends somewhere here. I mean, you know, he didn't need this uh, emphatic, uh, uh, you know, chimney. This reminds of, uh, of the works um, of uh, Antoni Gaudi in Barcelona. This is uh, moving beyond the uh, function, is, is moving into the realm almost of myth. And, uh, you know, almost fairy tale. But it, it's about fire. Let us not uh, hide this fact. A fire is not just something that we are afraid of, so we have to call the fireman. No, it's much more than that. It's, it's, it's maybe the, you know, the, the very beginning of the world, the primordial force, as Heraclitus called fire. Uh, fire uh, in Heraclitus' uh, vision came before, uh, before the gods, was, was the primordial force. But who taught architecture, Rudolf Steiner? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody taught him architecture, but he was able to build in and in a very, I would say, engaging and interesting way. Strangely, this philosopher turned also architect, came closer to the old understanding or definition of architecture as the queen of the arts. I mean, even this parapet, you know, for the, um, for the, for a stair, it's creative and it's like a thunderbolt, you know, and it's, it, it could refer to, you know, a uh, fire house, uh, a house from 1915, 1916, that this is the Goetheanum. No, no, it's a bit confused. No, it's a house that resembles the architecture of the Goetheanum. Now, he didn't really resolve, uh, I mean, on one hand, this anthroposophy and the quest for the synthesis of all arts. And on the other, of course, he was an Austrian with oblongs and these uh, rather, you know, sweet uh, windows. We can't forgive him for this. Or in a way, maybe it's appropriate. We have the, the sacred and the profane together to refer to a title by Mircea Eliade. And look at this uh, door, you know, this entrance uh, into the building, it's carved with a, with a sculptural ethos. Rudolf Steiner. He also designed furniture and built furniture, and we are going to see some examples. Well, these are actually built in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland all this campus where he built 17 buildings. And he worked with the volunteers. I hope I have here images showing uh, that, you know, he erected these buildings with volunteers, just as uh, perhaps Chartres Cathedral was rebuilt in the 12th century. That magnificent proof that human beings can unite if believing with the ardor they believed in then, in the 12th century. 
Transformer house, the second Goethe is on the right. Now look, you know, the blue building, the transformer house is whimsical and uh, interesting. So again, it, it moves beyond function. Now the second Goetheanum in Dornach, this is the model with all the buildings. The blue ones are built by him. Anthroposophic architecture. You know, the attempt to unite philosophy with architecture is a noble one, but are we thinking of such matter these days? Very rarely. Here, a philosopher is teaching us about a way of building that we forgot, a knowing architecture, if I can call it so. Uh, they probably had, or he probably had, uh, influential uh, supporters. You know, you cannot build such buildings with uh, an empty pocket. But one thing is for sure, in my opinion, we need vision. We need people of vision. We need visionary projects, visionary works. Works that try to change the world and not just uh, lower our heads and say, hey, you know, I'm just your slave, dear beneficiary or client. I will say yes to whatever you, you whisper, dear client. I will never oppose you because I have no visions. No, no, no. The architect should regain his and her verticality and, and uh, legitimate pride. Not an arrogant one, though, hopefully. Well, some of these things were over the years uh, refurbished. Architecture as a synthesis of the arts. Again, let's read again, because this is a rather unsettling title. Architecture as a synthesis of the arts. Arts. Lecture by Rudolf Steiner. And why are there so many members of the community of architects and students of architecture who are confused, who don't believe any longer that architecture is an art and certainly not the queen of the arts and certainly not an expression of a synthesis of the arts. But maybe this philosopher knew better. Here he works with many ladies in, you know, and I think that they found uh, truly uh, uh, a sense in their lives by contributing to a building that was based on, on theories, on a philosophy they, that they agreed with. So they were, they were animated by a new faith in a way. They were not building a cathedral, but the spirit was probably similar somehow. Goetheanum and the other buildings around it. You see a column there, the boiler room with its uh, emphatic uh, chimney. Now we look at these shapes, these forms, and tomorrow will be the birthday, the 94th birthday of Frank Gehry. In a way, nothing is new under the sun or under the sky or whatever. I mean, Frank Gehry was himself inspired by Bernini, the great Baroque Roman architect. Are we inspired by Bernini? I doubt it. But Frank Gehry was and is. But for a non-architect, I would say this building is great. I would say it would be great even for an architect.
Why did they build it in a dramatic way? Because drama is uh, warming up our souls. We saw the Serbians, now the Serbs, doing the same in former Yugoslavia. Expression, expression, spirit. Everything is designed, you know, even the handles of the doors. Building as an adventure, I truly believe, and I always believe so. Architecture and practicing architecture and building buildings should be adventures, adventurous. Otherwise, we die of boredom and we don't want that, do we? Concrete can be quite sculptural, too bad it pollutes, but, you know, maybe, who knows? That's why I, I, I keep saying, or I keep thinking that if we make the, the sacrilegious gesture of, uh, you know, risking having a little bit less ozone in the air, let's at least do it with good reasons. Let's at least build a building that you know, has no reasons to be ashamed that it throws a shadow on the earth. You could say, you know, God, please forgive me. Yes, I know I contribute to the climate change, but I built a beautiful building. Forgive me. I know, I know, I seen it's terrible what I did, but at least I built a beautiful building. Forgive me. But to build an ugly building, to build a meaningless building and still consume a lot of concrete and pollute the, the air, that, that, that should be a, a scene at, at a higher, much higher uh, um, you know, uh, power, so to speak. Anthroposophical architecture, this is uh, the building you see burnt. It was probably, you know, remade to an extent. Rudolf Steiner. Now some furniture by him. And he was excellent, you know, I mean, this chair, you know, considering he didn't study industrial design, but then this is not industrial design, it's sculptural design. With a pillow there, probably it wouldn't be too uncomfortable either. An interesting desk, and you see the spirit and the form of the furniture is not very dissimilar from the buildings. Solid wood, massive wood sculpturally, uh, you know, carved, even a lamp, another chair. This, this chair probably lasts more than the, the Egyptian pyramids. I mean, it's solid wood, as you can see. And look at this desk. This will never break. 
I mean, compare it with the, the IKEA, uh, you know, pieces of furniture, but those are made for the, you know, mass production. This is a unique piece. Rudolf Steiner, another chair. But some kind of uh, interesting meeting between the Gothic spirit and the modern spirit. Some artworks, and we'll end this uh, presentation on Rudolf Steiner was born today or on the 25th, it wasn't very clear, 27th of February or 25th. Um, he did all kinds of things, you know, even in painting, I think he was good. And I particularly like the art, I hope I have them here some artworks which actually were not intended as artworks, but they were done with the color chalk on blackboards as part of his lectures. And now they are kept in museums and they should because they are beautiful. So while he was giving lectures, he was also drawing with a very energetic, uh, you know, manipulation of the chalks on blackboards and those blackboards were preserved and now they are considered very valuable artworks. Um, the power of thought pictures on Rudolf Steiner's blackboards. Now you, we are going to see them. The power of thought pictures. What about the power of thought architectures? Rudolf Steiner, blackboard drawings, 1919-1924. I love these drawings. Knowledge of higher worlds, knowledge of higher worlds, knowledge of higher worlds. Look at them, they are beautiful. They express thinking, intense, fluid, cosmic, and uh, what can we say? Form and thought meet here in these uh, spontaneous uh, uh, graphic notations on blackboards. One hundred years ago, the thirty-first of March, maybe nineteen twenty-three or nineteen twenty-nine. Anyway, drawings by by Rudolf Steiner. He was a very intense man who was searching for something. Maybe he found that something. Maybe like Picasso, he could have said. I do not find things. I do not search, I find. Maybe he found these things without searching for them. It's possible. Well, you can find, I think, this. Uh, it's probably a book, Arte și Cunoaștere Arte in Romanian. Here is another beautiful. Uh, blackboard um, drawing or artwork. And you can tell that this man had a cosmic longing, a cosmic aspiration, almost mystical, maybe without almost. The 20th of April, 1923, 100 years ago. Maybe we need a philosopher, an anthroposophist or whatever, to tell us again what we forgot, that art and architecture are very close to each other and that architecture was, and maybe should be again, the queen of the arts, or at least attempt the synthesis of all arts, architecture, yes. Uh, Rudolf Steiner knew this.
But in order to arrive at such knowledge or such intuition, we need again to make room in our souls and in our imagination and in our mind for exaltation. This man was obviously an exalted man. But Walter Gropius himself said in the Bauhaus Manifesto that the only difference between the craftsman and the artist, and he included here the architect, is that the artist is an exalted craftsman. Without exaltation, you cannot arrive at such drawings, and without exaltation, you cannot build for spirit. And without exaltation, I don't think you, you can truly build in a truly significant way. You need something to exalt your soul, your imagination. And I don't think the refrigerator, the toilet, and the parking lot can do this. No, they can't. Sorry, but uh, I, I have great doubts that uh, functionalism can still nourish us. I'm tired of functionalism, I, I confess. It ruined architecture in the long run. It had some legitimacy at the beginning of the 20th century, but not any longer. Steiner's gravestone at the Goetheanum, here it is. Even the gravestone is, um, is creative. I don't know if he designed it or not, but it's in the spirit of, of the buildings that we saw. Rudolf Steiner. Okay, and now we go to the third presentation, an architect who is, uh, who received some, uh, some uh, you know, admiration even uh, in, in, in our country, maybe not only in our country, but let's see, let's see what, he, what he offers us today. Livio Vacchini, 1933-2007. This was the man, ideology and philosophy. So apparently he was uh, interested in philosophy too, in his own way, uh, although, in a very different way than Rudolf Steiner and his buildings show it, although he was trained as an architect, at least for a while. Livio Vacchini was a Swiss architect from Ticino, uh, born February 27th, and that's the reason we talk about him today, and died in 2007, uh, 74. Livio Vacchini was born in Locarno, from 1953 to 1958, he studied architecture at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. So he studied for five years. After staying in Stockholm and Paris from 1959 to 1961, he established his own architecture studio in Locarno called Studio Vacchini, Architetti, working closely with Luigi Snozzi and Silvia Knur. Uh, the works of, um, uh, again, I have problems here, sorry, I have to. The works of Livio Vacchini feature an extreme coherence of theme and practice. A strange way to put it, an extreme coherence of theme and practice. What could that mean, an extreme coherence? Each project is conceived ideally as the continuation of the lines of research explored by modern architects of the classical tradition such as Auguste Perret, whom we paid uh, homage to uh, not too long ago, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Louis Kahn. An extreme reduction of structural elements is present in all his designs, but I have to say, neither Perret nor Mies nor Kahn reduced the, uh, you know, uh, the, the expression of their buildings in an extreme way at all. The most important values of his works lie precisely in the intentional untimeliness. I'm, I don't know who wrote this, but uh, le let's continue. We have to talk about this. What does, what does this untimeliness mean? Because Frank Gehry, for example, who appears to be a very mundane, almost irresponsibly so figure of contemporary architecture, actually talked about, uh, you know, uh, uh, building uh, in, a, uh, um, you know, with an eye towards the absolute, towards the infinite. And maybe that's what is meant by this untimeliness. But it's the word itself, untimeliness is, um, 
is probably translated from a different language. Anyway, indifferent to novelty, interested only in respecting an inner coherence, detached, far from the chatter and gossip of the world of architecture of our time. Well, let's see what this inner coherence and detachment mean. Livio Vacchini designed houses, office buildings, schools, and community facilities in Switzerland and France. His major works are the School of Montagnola near Locarno, his own house in Costa, Switzerland, and the School of Architecture of Nancy, France. Casa, I don't know very well how to read, Beheim, uh, Solduno, uh, Locarno, 1961, 1962. Uh, what can we say? Uh, modernism through and through. To be honest with you, I know a little bit his work. I, I looked at the images of his work. I read some of his thoughts. He doesn't impress me a lot. And he doesn't impress me a lot because I think he's uh, a little bit stiff for my, um, for my uh, un, you know, understanding of um, creativity. It's too, you know, it, it's contrived, it's, uh, it's, um, it's rigid. Is rigid, and I think time, you know, to be uh, to be uh, timeless, to me means something else. But let's let's see some some other works by him. And the administrative building in Fabrizia, 1964, 1965. Uh, the building is located in the center of Bellinzona, next to the well-known Piazza del Sole. Uh, anyway, I, I, I don't like uh, reading uh, texts when I make presentations, especially after two other presentations. I, I, I am a little bit um, uh, tired and I know his architecture is going to make me even more tired because I think uh, in opposition to Rudolf Steiner and the great uh, builders and sculptors of uh, former Yugoslavia, he reminds me too much of the um, rationalism in a way of, 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 of uh, the functionalist school, you know, he might call this timeless architecture, but I see timelessness in Louis Kahn, but I don't see time, time, really timelessness in the work of uh, uh, Lucio uh, Livio Vacchini. I see more timelessness in Miss van der Rohe than in um, Livio Vacchini, low cost housing. Uh, this six levels apartment building is located on the delta of the now uh, over the air. It has undergone a radical transformation. Anyway, let's let's look at it. Now, uh, really, what is so timeless about it? You know, I mean, yes, I recognize the you know the rigor, and uh, but 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 what is it so timeless about it? It's it's a kind of architecture that. Uh, I have seen many times in Scandinavian countries, you know, and, and not only Scandinavian countries, it's, an, it's a predictable architecture. Yes, done with seriousness, it's true, but I don't see that cosmic quality that would uh, qualify it to be timeless. A pavilion neuropsychiatric county hospital, 1967, again with the same architect, Luigi Snozzi, again, is this a timeless architecture? In my opinion, it is not. Housing and Public Center, 1967-1969. Uh, apartment buildings. But I, I personally think that if you pass by it driving, you might not stop to look at the timeless piece of architecture. I'm sorry, I might stop to look at the tree on the left, yes. But the building, I don't think this is a space for rebellious students. I and mean, this is a space for uh, abiding students or obedient students. You know, they, it's, it's just, 
It's just too ordered in a restrictive way for my taste. I can't wait to talk about Frank Gehry. At least Frank Gehry in, with his uh, wild architectures is trying to break exactly what we are look, looking at it right now. Now the, his own house, Bacchini house, Ascona in Ticino, 1968, 1969. Um, maybe we'll come back to the text. This one though is more interesting in my opinion because it's not so, um, uh, also maybe because of the plans, and the structure is rather thin and unobstructive, unobstruct, unobstruct. I can't talk any longer in English. I should, I should abstain from doing three presentations in one day. Uh, this building I, I could accept, although there are other architectures very similar to this one, both in Europe and the United States. But this one, uh, uh, and being it's, it's a universe, it's a, an individual housing unit. It's a it's a dwelling for himself and his family. I think it's okay, but I wouldn't call this one timeless either. I mean, if this is timeless, then a lot of other buildings are timeless too. Um, Here I would say there are some echoes of, uh, of uh, Louis Kahn in, uh, in Bangladesh, maybe too explicit. I'm referring to that uh, hospital that uh, Louis Kahn built in uh, Bangladesh. What is its function? Lido, I don't know what this is. But while, while in the case of Louis Kahn, there is indeed an archetypal architecture, an Ur architecture, an architecture of great force and, and, and uh, you know, even um, uh, uh, cosmo cosmic attributes, as, as I would like to say, here I don't see this. It's just a mimicking of something that Louis Kahn did at a smaller scale and without any kind of uh, aspirations to communicate with the cosmos or with the sun or whatever you know it's it became a domesticated uh, feature casa lido i mean really this is uh, almost an architectural pastiche from louis khan in bangladesh just check it out the hospital that he built in Dhaka in Bangladesh, Louis Kahn. That doesn't impress me. Yeah, oh, I'm glad I have, I forgot. I, I prepared this uh, material um, two or three years ago. So now you'll see what Louis Kahn did for this hospital in Dhaka in Bangladesh. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's a different kind of architecture. It's heroic. It's powerful and it, it transcends it's tra it transcends the individual. It, it has it has a, a public uh, dimension here, you know, and, 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 and thus it connects with larger meanings. It, I, I, I regret that uh, you know what, what Khan did here uh, became in the case of, uh, of uh, Livio Bacchini something domesticated and essentially powerless. Uh, what we look at here is a, you know, a, a tamed architecture as opposed to this one by Khan, which is an untamed architecture. Alfredo house. Let's see the Alfredo house. Now I'm sorry. If this would have been described now, I don't know, maybe it's not a private house. I hope it's not, although it's, let's read it because I'm actually intrigued. Uh, those really neither its function or its internal distribution is a compact square building. The volume abstractness allows the combining of two functional aspects, the working and the living. I guess it's a house, but it doesn't look like a house at all. You know, I mean, would you live in such a house? I wouldn't. This could have been a museum, an office, an institution, but not a home, not a house. It's actually unbelievable. It's almost the, 
it's almost the antithesis of a home, of a house. And not because I have domestic, uh, you know, longings, because I don't. And I hate bourgeois life. But what I see here, it's, a, it's the very opposite of what a home is supposed to be. And look at, look at the side or the corner. No window is open. Everything is shut. It's as if this is clearly the statement of a misanthrope. I, really, this is not a house. Casa Alfredo. <laughs> no, no way. It's closer to death, actually, than to life. It could be a mausoleum of some sort. Maybe it's the house of a family all dead. Really, I, I, I don't understand this architect. Maybe I have an issue. Maybe I have problems. But Casa Bacchini. To cost Costa. This is someone else, another Vakini, I guess. The Vakini house in Costa is oriented southward and is formed by two identical and communicating spaces, both defined by a structure which is reduced to the limits of physical law. Uh, let's see. Now look at this again. Isn't this closer to death than to life? I mean, I could almost say it's an insult to the landscape. He, after we saw the Zara, beautiful Zarathustrian, you know, art and sculpture, I mean, sculpture and architecture of, of, of former Yugoslavia in uh, approximately similar uh, landscapes. Here we see this uh, alarmingly, alarmingly sterile building. I mean, is this supposed to be the entrance into the so-called house? There no window open, nothing, no opening. It's as if you enter into a garage, for God's sake, or some kind of a storage space, storage of corpses, probably, not living people. And the side the elevation, I would not call a timeless in any way. Yes, uh, I mean, I don't know. I see here, maybe I don't understand very well. Maybe there are shutters that, um, you know, uh, slide and cover the windows. But the interior to me is equally pretentious and uh, its glitter is, uh, um, is, 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 is artificial, you know, it's 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 the solitary space of a i would say a, a misanthrope of some sort who wants to enjoy by himself uh you know the the distant landscape now it's it's it's, it's something that I, I i i mean i am not lying i like more this building than this one even this one seems to be a little better than this one this one is a uh, a nuisance, you know, the arrogance of a well-to-do architect who is, uh, you know, playing, uh, being God kind of here, but I like much more this one. It's more humble, it's closer to the earth, it's made with organic materials. This is sheer, uh, this is uh, really uh, a nuisance, a nuisance in, in the landscape and a nuisance to the neighbors. I mean, if there are some sophistications here, they are very sterile, in my opinion. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm unacceptably uh, subjective. But Synagoga, Dresda, Germany, Germania, from 1997 in Dresden. I don't know who wrote this, a fascist synagogue. Of course, it is a, a paradox or an oxymoron, you know, because, uh, you know, it's like the president of Ukraine being accused of being a Nazi. 
this is what he proposed. I don't think it was built, but I'm very sorry. Whoever wrote this, a fascist synagogue, it might have, it might be right. Uh, 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 look at these elevations. Albert Speer probably would have loved this building. Maybe even Hitler. Although it was supposed to be a synagogue, Livio Vacchini said. But uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Turfer house. Concrete. At least here we see some wood. That's nice. You know, wood is warm. Wood saves the day a little bit. Now we look at these large windows, large pieces of glass, and what do you see looking through them from the inside? You know, you see this at, uh, I don't know, three meters distance. Isn't this an affectation? Why would one make such a huge, you know, uh, glass wall to, to contemplate what? I mean, I don't And uh, here you would understand, of course, you see a landscape as if you are in, uh, you know, in, in, in China somewhere with the mountains and the hills and the, you know, the falling waters um, covered by a thick uh, fog, but, but not here. I, whatever, this is a house of someone well-to-do, you know, who can afford the sophistication of, Leo Vac uh, of Livio Vacchini. And um, it might even be that that's, that is a, a table by, what's her name, a Spanish, uh, French actually architect. Uh, I forgot her name. She does, uh, you know, tables like this, or she did on, on wheels. They seem to be wheels. Uh, Olenti, Olenti, yes. Who, be, who did actually a beautiful work in Barcelona uh, and also in Paris, the Musée d'Orsay. But in Barcelona, the, the Museum of Catalan, uh, old Catalan art, very, very nice works. Well, it seems some people live well, no? I mean, look at that. That bed is wider than it is long. You can have easily six people sleep in, the, in this bed, not two. But what they look at is what we look at. I think in a way this represents, although you cannot look at here because the counter of the kitchen is oriented uh, towards the other side. So when you when you labor at the sink or at the, at the stove, you turn your back on the splendor outside. Um, a commercial, administrative and commercial building on, on Locarno, another timeless work by Livio Vacchini, based on the greed, 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 and greed again. Maybe we could even write G-R-E-E-D instead of G-R-I-D. Here yeah, there is a, something metaphysical a little bit because of the obsessional, uh, you know, unchanging nature of the grid. A little bit, but, but, but we, we still see the same, um, you know, enlightened architect who still believes in, in reason and in the 90 degrees angle and in the grid. Uh, so did uh, Peter Eisenman, but, but Peter Eisenman, at least after he started with the grid, as he said, he said, all architecture should start with the grid. 
But then he modified, he deformed, he altered the grid, not Livio Vacchini. He remained, you know, loyal to the grid to the very end. Who knows, maybe the experience, the real experience of his buildings might um, contradict what I, I try to um, express today um, rather spontaneously. But, but what I see here makes me remember what Louis Kahn said when he was asked what he thought of the uh, New York Five, the so-called New York Whites. Those New York Whites or New York Five were Richard Meyer, um, Charles Guidme, Peter Eisenman, John Haydock, and uh, Michael Graves. And uh, Louis Kahn said, first he called them playboy architects and then he said i prefer to do what is right the wrong way than to do what is wrong the right way and i have the feeling that livio vacchini does exactly this he does the right way what is wrong he does what is wrong in the right way and I, a house of three women i like that name the project presented a single building divided into three separate houses united by a large terrace. The construction measures 60 meters long and 10 meters wide. Each house has two levels. Each housing unit consists of a closed part and an open one, the portico. The surface of each house is 60 meters square meters. Same for the portico. They are living dual height close towards the lake. The height of each house is six meters. Everything is with six years, I can see, with the exception of the width, which is 10. On the ground floor are the kitchen and the living room, while upstairs there are the bedroom, bathroom, and office. There is the bedroom. No, upstairs there are the bedroom, bathroom, and office. The elevation, elevation of structures, floors, and ceilings are in concrete, plaster and rear metal and glass for windows. Three lonely women. Three solitudes enveloped by, um, you know, a carcass of concrete and glass and steel. This makes one think uh, a little bit of Tadao Ando. A lot of glass. Does any window open here? Residenza in Tequila, in Muralto, Ticino. Uh, I don't know Italian, although I, I feel for a change of, uh, of appetite to, to read a little bit in Italian, although I don't, need, I don't know Italian to my shame, but the change of the language could make me feel better. L'edificio è composto di due volumi distinti Nel primo volume, a est, ci, ci sono gli appartamenti da, uh, con la terrazza aperta sui tre lati. Ah, I wish I, know, I knew Italian. Now look at that, uh, look at that uh, column there, you know. Why is it slanted? All of a sudden, probably uh, Mr. Uh, Livio Vacchini became uh, tired of himself and his grids and his rectangularity, and all of a sudden slanted uh, <laughs> A column there. Ah, no, he slanted too. I wonder why. <laughs> Probably for the same reason I began to do, attempt to try to read in Italian. He got bored of himself. 
the Brooklyn is the only sign of life in this space that uh, whatever it is, you know, that piece of furniture bought probably for a significant amount of money from a, a you know, antique uh, furniture shop. Now, I'm very sorry. I even forgot this building. Oh, when I look at this elevation, I, uh, I almost become angry. I mean, really, this is ridiculous. Uh, really, this uh, zigzagging uh, could be uh, interpreted uh, in a certain way by uh, Dr. Freud very well. Really, what is this? I could be very, very harsh now. I prefer to, to avoid using certain words, but this is ridiculous. Could we call it timelessness? Come on, come on, really, please. God. Centro Sportivo e di Formazione. Wow. Fortunately, it was not built. Unfortunately, there are people on bikes, but the building is deadly. Really. Uh, but fortunately, there is some color there on the on the on the flooring of the large, um, uh, you know, sports event uh, area. But otherwise, God, you know, look at this grayness. No, uh, gymnasium. Let's see. Ah, it was built. Well, it looks a little bit better built because uh, at least there is more color, but the gray is still there. And this one is inspired too. I, I know examples from uh, Japan. Well, in my opinion, is the detrimental understanding of what timelessness, but he didn't call it timelessness. Untimeless, untimeliness. Maybe there is a difference between timelessness and untimeliness, timeliness. Timelessness and untimeliness, God. It's a gymnasium. I wouldn't like to, to study here. I wouldn't like even to play sport. Although what's nice, it looks through that window and you see the beauty of nature, trees, sky, colors. Antonin Raymond, yes, that's what I wanted to show. This was the architect who built this in Japan Look at this. But uh, Anthony Raymond was uh, more uh, sculptural and more dramatic than uh, Lucio, uh, Livio Vacchini. The rhythm is more powerful in, in uh, Raymond. I can read. Piccino again. Even this was done before. This man found inspiration in the work of several architects. There was an architect in Spain who built, who uses this uh, motif, so to speak, at a smaller scale. And I, I don't know if I have here the, yes. Francisco Javier Saenz de Oiza from 1950s. Look at this. Uh, but uh, again, the original is much better than um, uh, the pastiche. And this is what uh, uh, Livio Vacchini did. I, in my opinion, well, I don't know who said it. Maybe Einstein again, because all quotations seem to come from uh, Albert Einstein. But he says something like this, that the genius is the one who uh, inspires himself from other people without ever being able to, to tell the source of the inspiration. But this is not the case with Livio Vacchini. It's very clear where the inspiration came from. Livio Vacchini and Deo Isa here. And Luis Kahn. 
but Louis Kahn, again, a, a different kind of architect. In the case of Louis Kahn, contemplating the ceiling of his art gallery at Yale University, we see a man who truly aspired towards uh, timelessness, but not maybe untimeliness. Louis Kahn, Yale Art Gallery, the roof, actually, I mean, is the ceiling actually, but I, I, this is the roof actually of that, um, of that, of what we look at here from the inside. Louis Kahn, this title should have been before the images, I'm sorry, the Yale Art Gallery roof 1950s. And this is the building by um, Livio Vacchini. In my opinion, he didn't transcend sufficiently well the source of inspiration. Uh, his source of, sources of inspiration, apartments house, La Penise. Um, despite the fact that is executed very well in terms of you know construction in my opinion is not a singing building thus the stones so to speak are not um, are not uh, singing and uh, if they are not singing Livio Vacchini is not a neopalinos meaning an architect or if he is thinking something I don't like what I hear Really, what's so musical about this building? I'm tired of these, uh, you know, stiff, inhibited and inhibiting architectures, really. Steiner, you know, said yes to life in a more uh, generous way. And, and so did the uh, magnificent uh, sculptors and builders of those monuments in uh, former Yugoslavia. Nova sede ambulance, Salva, Locarno, Ticino. Ah. Is it timeless? Not for me. If he would have told me this is a private residence, I would have believed him because we saw before something very similar, which he called Casa Alberto or whatever. Uh, it was identical with this, almost identical. But that was a private residence, and this is an ambulance, uh, I don't know. Nova said ambulance. No, no. Ampliamento cimitero comunale. Now, I'm sure he didn't design the, the, these are all the graves. Maybe he did the, uh, you know, the the works here. Uh, I guess, yeah. Well, if he did this one as well, this one I like. But otherwise, death and death again. Uh, maybe unredeeming. Secondary school, the scholastic complex. Now look at this. Really, if I was a high school student, I would cry and cry and hit the floor with my with my with my foot until my parents would understand that I don't want to go to this school. I just don't want to enter the mausoleum, the mortuary chamber here. You go through that the door and you know you are going to be um, mortified inside now the side elevation is probably different but this is the main elevation you enter through this way you know it's yeah about the other one is not better what do we see here a soldier school all windows identical aligned rows of identical windows in a building whose mission is to create identical human beings. I don't like it at all. I like the mountain. Unfortunately, it's close enough to the building, so I would quickly exit through this door, turn around, and run to the forest and to the mountain and to the hill and forget about this nonsense so-called timeless or untimely and untimely. 
no 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 bikino even the even the the interest doors if they are interest doors they are strange you know they are not even functional you know put glass so low you feel like hitting it and indeed if you are uh, you know so called educated in this building you feel like breaking this breaking the the glass here with the with the, the appropriate boot and here with a fist ah no no the high schools in romania are much better without uh, pretentious uh, philosophies or pretentious architects behind them just banal buildings but much more human that's it i'm i'm disappointed by mr um, uh, livio vacchini sorry for being so sincere with you but uh, after stein uh, rudolf steiner and uh, and the great um, Serbian artists and architects, uh, I, I cannot take um, Livio Vacchini for too long.